Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining for our monthly uh, investment webinar. Um, I know that we've still got people uh, joining, so we're sort of kick up and start to kick off and start to warm up. Uh, I have um, my esteemed colleagues joining me this afternoon. Uh, we're trying to uh, throw a few more ideas, opportunities, uh, and companies uh, this afternoon. So we're going to have a little bit more. Uh, discussion and hopefully a little bit more uh, interaction over the next 30 to 40 minutes or so. Uh, so hopefully uh, this should be reasonably standard for many of you by now. There's no need to uh, write too much down. We'll be able to send you over a link to the whole session. Uh, obviously a lot of the slides fall into our monthly slide update anyway. There is a Q&A box at the bottom so if there are any questions uh, that come up uh, please feel free to chuck them in there and we'll either address them at the end of individual sections or we'll come back to them at a specially designed point at the end and uh, if you have got any questions feedback suggestions things that you would like to hear about maybe at the next one then please feel free to reach out to your relationship manager uh, and we will um, try to take on as many of the suggestions as we can so just uh, to sort of take a little bit of a uh, dance through the world of performance, obviously being one month in, there's not too much to talk about. And it's been a reasonably uneventful January from a market's perspective and, and some uh, sort of stances, given that we've not had some of the equity market volatility that we were fearing given the transition of Trump. But ultimately, if I just skip on to uh, performance for January, uh, we saw a steepening of the uh, yield curve in both the US and uh, sterling denominated bonds. So you can see that the conservative uh, portfolios fared slightly worse than their more aggressive counterparts on the back of some of these uh, increasing yields that we have seen at the longer end of the curve. Um, the euro mandates uh, in contrast, which haven't had so much movement, have actually fared uh, better. This is kind of the opposite of what we had in March 2020. Uh, when we saw the interest rate cuts in the UK and the US giving quite a lot of protection, more so than we had in uh, some of our European counterparts. So sort of one month in, not really a particularly strong indication of how the year is going to go, uh, but just sort of wanted to flash that. And obviously it's been a slightly negative uh, start from a January perspective anyway. Uh, looking at our asset allocation, there are a couple of changes just to run through briefly. Um, as you can see, our cash balances have increased after we sold down some of our global equity exposure. Uh, this was us de-risking the portfolios a little bit, and we sold down our <coughs> MSCI World holding. So you can see global equities dropping from 21% of the portfolio to 12%. And we did make one purchase, which was into the alternative space, and we picked up a, a healthcare fund. Um, so we've seen a couple of... Uh, changes sort of filtering through into the portfolio. Um, but I'm not going to take too much time uh, now. I'm going to hand over to um, our macro maestro. Uh, beforehand, uh, we're trying to get a little bit more interactivity throughout this. So we have got a couple of polls just to get people's views on uh, different uh, items. I'm going to launch this. Uh, I'll pass across to James to start talking through uh, the macro section whilst you guys are filling in the polls and then we can uh, start to have a little talk about some of the answers. So polls should be out there now. Please feel free to answer and I'll pass across to James. Macro maestro. Uh, I feel like I've got um, a little bit of pressure there. My goodness. Um, Right, so today what I'd like to do is to focus uh, the conversation on inflation. Um, this is really the most important question out there right now. Uh, I think if, if, uh, if you think about some of the comments that I've been making over the course of recent months and quarters, I've emphasized how important the, um, the US Treasury outlook is going to be for this risk uh, this equity, uh, this equity move, the, the move into risk assets. And I think the treasury outlook is going to be heavily determined by inflation. So I'm going to start by asking a few questions about uh, the recent Eurozone inflation numbers and what that might be telling us. And uh, then I'll move on to some 
some investigation of uh, where inflation expectations look like they're taking us. And then I want to, I want to spend the final part of, of my, my few minutes talking about uh, inflation regimes, and whether we're on the cusp of something new. So if we go to the next slide, um, there, was a, there was a real surprise in January. Uh, Eurozone inflation year over year uh, spiked. Uh, it went up to 0.9% year over year, and that was versus market expectations of about 0.3. Um, so you don't usually get a lot of volatility in Eurozone uh, consumer price inflation. And, and it, it certainly got my attention. Now I know that that red line on the, on the graph that you're looking at doesn't necessarily tell you it's getting out of control, um, but it's a big move. And I think that this has really concentrated people in the market's uh, attention on what might be going on in the inflation space. And it's someplace that they need to be paying attention. So if we go to the next slide, Maestra. Inflation expectations have been, um, have been accelerating. So on the left-hand side, uh, where there are many surveys of inflation expectations. I use the ZEW uh, out of Germany because they, they provide a consistent methodology and they, they pose the question of investors and professionals in the US, UK, and Germany. And across the board, um, what we have are, uh, are uh, inflation expectations at basically cyclical highs. So the percentage of people who expect inflation to accelerate in uh, in the coming uh, in the coming year are uh, it, it's at it's at the uh, it's at the upper end of the range. And if I look at the poll results uh, which you have just uh, which you've just shared with us, I see that that's broadly consistent with uh, with those of you who are viewing this pre this presentation. So uh, 60, 6D, 60 percent of you think that inflation in this year, 2021, will be higher than it was in 2019, which was the year before the pandemic. I think the pandemic year doesn't really count, uh, but the year before the pandemic uh, was, was sort of the last time we were, at, we were normal. And I think most of you expect inflation to accelerate. And I think that's right. I think that's what most people in the markets expect as well. And if you look at the right-hand side, the five-year, five-year forward break-even rates, which is how the financial markets are pricing forward inflation. Again, the story is very, very similar. Um, there's been a pretty big increase uh, across the board in the US, in, uh, in Germany, and in the UK. So that in the US, for example, which is that purple line, uh, the five-year, five-year forward uh, break-even has, uh, has punched through 2%. So the markets look like they are well into that zone which the, uh, which the Treasury, uh, the US Federal Reserve rather, has said is going to be its target for average inflation targeting. So if we move to the next slide. Now, one of the questions that we often have to ask ourselves is whether or not we're measuring inflation correctly. And in some ways, it's kind of like uh, an endless question. It's, uh, it's sort of like, how long is a piece of string? Well, it sort of depends. Um, you're never gonna measure inflation perfectly, but I think we do a reasonably good job. One of the things that has happened over the past year is it's very clear in my mind, um, we're not measuring inflation well in 2020. And, and the obvious reason is that we've changed our consumption baskets. So we're all sitting at home for the most part, which means that we're not going out and we're not flying in airplanes as much as we used to. We're not sitting, you know, going to bowling alleys or going to restaurants like we used to. Now airplanes and bowling alleys and restaurants all are part of the consumption basket that's used to calculate CPI. So clearly there's, there's a mistake in them. So there's, a, um, there's an academic, uh, uh, Professor Alberto Cavallo, who, who did a really interesting study. And uh, what he did is he recalculated inflation in the US with a basket that accurate, more accurately reflects what Americans are actually spending their money on uh, during the, the global pandemic. And um, that's that, I guess you'd call it blue. So there's a blue line, which is the, uh, the inflation basket adjusted for, uh, for the COVID uh, consumption pattern. And then there's the teal line, I guess it is, which is that, that inflation basket not adjusted. And, um, and what he shows is that there's about a half a percentage point of inflation out there that we're probably not even picking up yet in the official statistics. And I think that's about right. Um, if you just sort of reflect upon your own personal experience, you know, what you're ordering off of Amazon or, you know, what's coming in, uh, in, your, uh, in your Ocado basket if you're in the UK, 
And there's been a little bit of price pressure there for those things which we can consume. And conversely, there's been a little bit of deflationary pressure uh, for you know, airline tickets, which have not been in as high demand. And if you look on the right-hand side, you can see this in that, um, in that contrast between prices, uh, the inflation rate for goods versus services. So the dark blue line is services inflation. And that's been running in the US at a steady sort of two to 4% annual rate um, for about 25 years or so. What's really interesting is that over that same period, there's been deflation in durable goods. And that, that is a very much a, a China-related story as, as well as a productivity story. Um, we've gotten much better at uh, delivering washing, producing washing machines and cars. We haven't gotten much better at you know, producing haircuts, um, which would be in services. You can see that for the first time in 25 years, durable goods inflation has, has spiked well above above zero, it's now pushing 2%. And I think that reflects that, um, that CPI basket having changed. So we're starting to see some inflationary pressures. And that tells me that, uh, that this European pickup in, uh, in measured inflation may not be a fluke. Um, I do think that there's some inflationary pressure out there in, in the system that's working its way through. So if we go to the next slide, this brings me to then to um, what I think is one of the, the most crucial questions. Um, are 35 years of price stability coming to an end? So on the left-hand side, what you can see is two different inflation regimes for the US over the past uh, century. So this goes back to 1925. Now, there's a reason why I talk about the US. Um, one, uh, the data is very good and it has a long history. Um, which may not be the best reason, but it is a reason to use the U.S. Two, for most of that century, the U.S. has been something between 25 and 50 percent of global GDP. So if you can explain the U.S., then you can explain 25 to 50 percent of the world, which is kind of kind of important. Um, and of that part of the world which isn't the U in the U.S., it tends to be very, very correlated with the U.S. That's because of the dollar's central role, because of U.S. financial service, uh, the U.S. financial sector as being very central uh, to the global economy, et cetera, and so forth. So there's a lot of correlation between what happens in the U.S. and what happens outside of the U.S. And over the past uh, century, we have seen uh, regimes where we go from high inflation, which is in that pink bar, and uh, low inflation, which is in that light green bar. And so you can see that in that, in that pre-World War II period, we were in a, uh, in a low inflation, actually a deflationary environment for part of it. Um, inflation averaged minus 1.3% over that period. Um, during the, the World War II era, uh, inflation was actually running at more like 6.1% as the, as, the as the US economy and the global economy overheated while, uh, while we were trying to, 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 uh, to to, to fight this war. Post-war, uh, the 1950s through 1965 was a period of low inflation, uh, around one and a half percent cumulative annualized growth rate over that period. And this, this came to an end with the acceleration of the US war in Vietnam, with an accommodative Fed, with an increase in fiscal spending, uh, with uh, Johnson and the Great Society, a lot, of, a lot of big ticket spending items that caused the US economy to overheat. And then we saw stagflation, or 6.8% inflation during the 1970s. And, and that wasn't brought to an end until, um, until Volcker in the 1980s. And this is really important. The past 35 years, which is the lifespan of many people on trading desks today, we have been in a low inflation environment. And not just low, not just inflation around 2%-ish, 2.5%-ish, but also steady. If you look at the right-hand side of the chart, it's very faint. Um, I think my, the colors of my graph didn't come out terribly well, but uh, from 1985 to 2020, that there's a, a sort of a purple shaded area that shows that um, the, the, the rolling quarterly change in US core CPI was basically flat. There was basically no volatility in CPI. So not only were, was the, the, the rate of inflation low, but the change in the rate of inflation just didn't move. That 35 years of price stability has defined the markets as we know it. Now, now is that going to continue? Well, there's some inflationary factors which are, are which make make a difference now. 
um, money supply growth is accelerating. So M2, as I've shown in many on, on a number of occasions over past months, has absolutely skyrocketed. The output gap is narrowing fast. And, and, and something that, I, um, that I've been uh, harping on for a while now, the US may have the fastest pace of GDP growth in 2021 that we've seen for, for quite a few years uh, between stimulus spending, uh, pent up demand with ample savings ready to be unleashed and an extremely accommodated, accommodative monetary policy. 2021 is gonna be an explosive year for growth. Um, commodity cycle. We all, we're all very aware about how crude oil is picked up, copper is picked up, but you can add semiconductors to the list. Um, there's a shortage of semiconductors and prices are working their way through the supply chain. Uh, there's been a, the Biden administration in the US and, um, and in other places around the world, there's been an increase in, um, in, the, in, in wages for those at the lower end, the, those people who have been most dramatically affected by the coronavirus. Uh, the minimum wage is now, um, uh, being tapped to increase to $15 in the U.S. And there's been a, a stealth universal basic income as, as people are receiving checks for the, from their governments, um, just uh, as, a, as a matter of course. China is no longer dis exporting disinflation. This is something that's happened over the past several years. Wages are, are, have, started, have accelerated in, uh, in China uh, as, they've, as they've come closer to the global norm. Um, so China's, Chinese manufacturing is not quite the disinflationary force that it used to be, and globalization is no longer the disinflationary force that it's used to be. So there's, um, we're, we're very, I'm sort of very aware of this with Brexit, where the, the uh, Europe now being cut off from the UK means that there's been, um, there's been some hiccups in moving goods from Europe to the UK and, and the other direction. And that means that a lot of the efficiency gains that have benefited us to help to keep uh, have helped to keep prices low have been um, have been eroded. Now there are some disinflationary factors out there. Uh, people do not yet expect inflation, and inflation is very driven by expectations. Now once that changes, the Federal Reserve and other central banks will have a big problem on their hands. But as the Bank of Japan has demonstrated, if you're not going to get anywhere until so you can get people to expect inflation. I have people on my team who have never, who were not even alive during the period of high inflation. So I think those expectations are probably pretty uh, deeply, uh, deeply rooted. Productivity. There may still be room for technology to help to increase productivity, which has a disinflationary impact. And demography. Aging societies tend to be uh, very disinflationary. So if we go to the next and final slide. I think that price instability might be around the corner. Now, price instability means higher inflation, so the average rate of inflation increases, and it means less uh, stable uh, inflation rates, so it jumps around quite a bit more. Now, the last time that happened was in the 1970s uh, and into the early 1980s. That was not a good period for equity and, uh, and high-yield uh, investors. Actually, that was not a good period for any investor. Um, what I'm showing you here are the log the logarithm of total returns for these four asset classes. And I've rebased everything to zero in 1925. Again, I'm using that very long, long period of history. And, um, and I'm showing you is that the 1970s were a period where, uh, where returns really stagnated. Look and on the left-hand side where that blue line is, uh, is what you made in the S&P. So this includes dividends. From, from 1969, 70 or so, uh, 66 or so, uh, you basically made nothing until the early 1980s. Your, return, your portfolio went up and down, but it, it effectively didn't return anything after inflation. Uh, your high yield underperformed relative to inflation. If you go to the right-hand side chart in green, uh, you basically broke even with your government, uh, your government bond portfolio and you lost money on your investment grade portfolio. That hurt, that hurt a lot. So I think that's a, that's a risk that, that I'm very aware of that we're, that we're on the cusp of. What I don't think is gonna happen is what we saw in uh, sort of the early 2000s. So after the dot-com bubble burst, you had a period where, um, where there was a, you know, a sort of a, a sideways move in, um, in equity returns and, and then you, you got, to, you got to, the, uh, to the global financial crisis, but you had the bond market handsomely compensate you. 
So if you look at the graph from 2000 to 2010, your equity returns, even your high yield returns were very unimpressive, but the bond market did absolutely stunning. That's not going to continue because bonds are already so expensive. There's just no room for bonds to appreciate to that degree over the course of the coming decade. So that's, that explains a lot of how I'm positioning our portfolio uh, at the moment and, and looking out over the coming years. Um, I expect that gaining, uh, that, that earning returns is going to be more difficult and is gonna require uh, a bit more uh, careful investing. Put differently, passive investment's not really gonna work if the S&P 500 is just gonna give me a sideways story for the next, uh, for the coming five or 10 years, uh, I'm gonna have to be a little bit more nimble and I have to be a little bit more selective. And I think you'll see that, uh, you've seen that already in our portfolio se selection process. And I think you're gonna continue to see that in our portfolio selection process. And that is the extent of my question of, I'm sorry, of my, uh, of my presentation this month. So if there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to take them now. Otherwise, uh, I can hand it back to Simon and we can go ahead and, um, and move on to the next section, fixed income. I was gonna say, James, you've been talking about inflation. We've had a question just come in asking about deflation and whether that's something that's on your horizon or not. That's an excellent question. Uh, it's a fantastic question. Um, <sighs> So deflation is a risk. Now, the reason why deflation would be a risk is if there was a, a, an, an implosion in global growth. And I think um, the risk of deflation is not zero. Um, it's still a, a potential, but I think it's a low risk. And the reason why I think it's a low risk is because central banks, and most notably the US Federal Reserve, have really gone all in in stimulating the economy and in trying to make sure that we get some inflation. So if you, if you roll the clock back about a year, uh, we were having, you know, we were debating uh, through these webinars um, whether or not we thought inflation was going, to, was, going to, was going to occur. And one of my arguments was that at the end of the day, the Fed can make it happen. Um, whether helicopter Ben drops money into people's savings accounts uh, or in, uh, liquidity just goes through the roof, they have a lot of tools at their disposal and they have an interest to make sure it happens. And what we're seeing right now is that inflationary pressure pick up. If the global economy, if the US economy stumbles and we have an implosion in growth and activity, that's when we get the inflationary outcome. That would be very, very bad. There was Adrian eager to, there, there is just one question and this one actually, that, sorry, there's one more question. This one uh, probably actually nicely blends from you over to Adrian, which is about, um, the question is essentially, are, are, or is quantitative easing in our central banks distorting current outlook and the impact of inflation? I think the question is, to what extent are they rather than are they? Um, but maybe you can give us your thoughts and then we can pass across to Adrian to sort of give his and then migrate into fixed income. Absolutely, and that's great. that is a great segue into, uh, into fixed income. So the short answer is absolutely. QE central banks are uh, squarely behind um, this, uh, what, distorting the current outlook, but, but in introducing inflation. And we can see inflation already in asset prices where you have these, uh, these bubbles appearing um, everywhere. And you are likely to see that enormous liquidity um, from central banks, from QE, uh, spark inflation in later on this year, particularly as economies unlock and as that real demand uh, marries up with that ample liquidity. So yes, I think, uh, I think that's a, a fairly straightforward answer. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hand it over to my colleagues, uh, Adrian and Jeff, because there's a, there's a nice transition here from, from inflation to, to fixed income. Uh, any other questions, please feel free to put them down the chat. Uh, thank you, James. I think you've really set the scene quite nicely for what's going on in the fixed income market. Remember, one of the key things that we're most concerned about in the government, government bond market is inflation. What is it going to be happening? And going back to that question about central banks, remember central banks with their key programs have actually encouraged more fiscal spending um, by governments. Governments now see the cost of capital very cheap so they can actually promote their programs and this will be inflationary there's going to be more debt 
um, coming through. This is part of the concerns that we have. And if we move on to the next slide, what we've seen is what Simon's been talking about is what's hurt us in our portfolios, especially the conservative portfolios, is this steepening of the US Treasury curve. It has been going on for a while, but it's really starting to pick up more pace now. What we've seen is the chart on the left is the two years versus 10 year spread between the yields of those two benchmark bonds. And we can see historically, there has been very precise periods of curve steepening. Now, we've identified five, four um, periods in the past and when the fifth period at the moment, which actually started and we start looking at it from when the yield curve touches zero goes negative and then starts going back into positive territory again. Now, what we've seen is that in the prior periods, the average length of time that this steepening occurs is over roughly 1,200 odd days. And on average, we're getting about 290 basis points of potential steepening. Now, even in taking into account what happened last year, we've actually had 500 days of steepening happening. Remember the Fed cuts, the move down the yield curve of yields was another dynamic just to, as a response. But overall, the curve did steepen. We've had 102 basis points. And from our analysis and based on history, it shows that there's potentially roughly 700 more days of steepening to occur and 190 basis points of further steepening could occur. This for me is my sort of longer term scenario for what is going to be happening in the US. I think we are in the period where you've got a lot of fiscal, a lot of supply coming through. There's a bit of a fight coming in by the Fed on trying to keep yields down. And it's going to be interesting how this dynamic occurs. If we move on to the next slide, what we can see is that the Fed has actually been very good at doing one thing. They've actually kept the front end expectations down. There's been very little movement in the front end of the US yield curve. All the movement, all the volatility is actually in the longer end of this curve. And what this is sort of telling me is that the U Fed is quite happy to let the market build up the inflation expectations that we've seen, the break even are now above 2%. It's forced the long end of the curve to move from 10 years up to the 30 years. It's letting them actually reprice that part of the market. But for me, the question really becomes, can they risk letting this part of the yield curve go too fast, too quickly? They can't really risk a taper tantrum. The reason for this is there's no room for mistakes. We've got a highly sensitive US economy to interest rates. They won't be raising anytime soon, but inflation will be a concern for them, as James mentioned. Now, what we're going to see is any small upward moves in the actual interest rates is going to have a bigger impact than in past cycles. This is because, as we've talked about in the past, in the previous months, the US economy has too much corporate debt. It has too much government debt outstanding. It's very sensitive now to debt interest payments. And then the question really becomes, if the equity valuations are currently where they are, with the dividend yield about 1.4, 1.5% on the S&P, at what stage does the treasury yield start becoming attractive relative to the equity markets? They do not want to actually start tapering. They do not want to start thinking about easing the conditions until they really see PCE averaging the 2%. That's one of their key targets. But also, they want to keep asset purchases in place until they see their maximum employment and price stability come back in. This, I think, will take a little bit more time. So I think this year is going to be a story of trying to sell your treasury positions into strengths. As James and Simon's mentioned, the yields are not very attractive. You know, 15 basis points, 30 basis points movements in the 10-year 
equates to one two percent, which wipes out an entire carry for the year. This is something we touched upon last month. Therefore, it's one of the reasons why we're underweight um, on the treasury market, and we prefer to be getting our yield in the credit markets. And at this point, I think Jeff is very good to talk about what's going on there and where we will be sourcing our positions. Great, thanks a lot, Adrian. And uh, let me continue that theme and conversation then. So let's look at corporate bonds in a multi-asset context. Now, I mean, Adrian and James have already alluded to we expect inflation and supply and treasuries to place upward pressure on the treasury yield curve. Now, how will this affect corporate bonds? Well, let's start with investment grade and look at the correlation of total returns between treasuries and IG rated corporate bonds. Let's look at the average correlation in each year independently. Now, we've seen that the through the two previous cycles, um, we've seen strong positive correlation, averaging around 0.85, so very positive um, uh, and very strong. But that relationship did decouple to varying degrees in each of the last market downturns uh, in 2001, 2008, uh, and more substantially so in 2020, where we saw corporate bond spreads rally in the back half of last year, but treasuries traded more or less within the range. But we expect that relationship to reforge this year under more normal market conditions. So we do hold a negative outlook on long dated IG corporate bonds. Uh, and we're actually currently running our IG positions at currently half the duration of the benchmark to insulate our client portfolios from the effects of any potential bear steepening. Now it's a very different story with the high yield market. Now junk bonds are, they're slightly different uh, in that when we assess it, we think of it as a hybrid as asset class where it has characteristics of both fixed income in that it pays a coupon, but also exhibits characteristics that are similar to equities because of its price volatility. Now, if we look at the chart to the right, the US high yield market, it's, um, it's become increasingly more correlated with the S&P 500. A couple of reasons for that. For one, it's grown in size. It was, um, it had a total market value of 270 billion um, at the turn of the millennium. Um, and that has grown to 1.4 trillion as of the most recent month. And the number of issuers as well has grown from under a thousand and it's doubled to close to the 2000 now. So you've got these factors and combining that with the increasing number of market participants in the US high yield space, that's driven up the correlation to, uh, with that and the equity markets. Now we're cognizant of this rise in correlation between the two asset classes, um, but we're also aware that there are nuances, uh, which is why there isn't a perfect correlation between the two. For example, in equities, in global equities, you've got higher concentration in China, you've got higher concentration in technology uh, companies as well. Whilst in global high yield, there's more of a bias towards the US and industry-wise, there's more of a focus on the financials, banks, insurance, energy, and real estate as well. But nevertheless, the relationship is positive and it's strong. And we're aware that the equity markets are trading at stretched valuations. So we think that the price upside on the broader high yield index is limited for 2021. So we're running our high yield positions at around two thirds of speed. We just move on to the next slide. All of that said about our expectations for price performance in the high yield market, we can't forget that high yield does provide an enhancement of income to any portfolio, particularly during these yield starved times. Now let's recall the, the definitions of yield and total return, which are not the same. Yield is the annualized rate of return if you hold the bond to maturity while total return is the price return plus the income return from the coupon in any one year. If we look at the past decade, two events that are most noticeable, we saw a slump in bond prices in 2015, almost a 10% decline. That was due to the commodities route, but that was quickly followed by a rebound in, in the following year. And then more recently at the back end of 2018, with uh, it was amidst rising trade tensions between the US and China that led to a market downturn, which affected the US high yield market. 
but again we saw a rebound the following year and then more recently in 2020 this was sharper and it was quicker we saw that dip in March last year, but that was quickly recovered in the second half of the year, where price performance actually broke even, which is why you can you don't actually see a blue bar on that chart to the left because price performance was actually close to zero percent. And if you look at the price performance or the price return throughout this whole cycle, you would have only earned three percent in return through price movement, but the income return that you would have uh, received from clipping 11 years of coupons that would have accumulated to a return of a staggering return of 110 percent so i think we should need to implore the point that we can't forget about the powerful compounding effect of coupon return now talking about um the yield starved environment that we're in i think um, it's best illustrated with the chart that i've got on the right where we look at the composition of yield in the high yield index. I break it into two simple components. You've got the underlying treasury yield, which is in that light blue color. And you've also got the credit spread, which is in the, the darker purple color. And in the era that was leading up to the financial crisis, the underlying treasury rate was, you know, it was a fairly significant part of the all in yield. In fact, you could only increase your yield by moving from treasuries into junk bonds by about 50% or almost doubling it. But after 2008, under the low interest rate regime that we saw in the past cycle, well, in fact, if you were to move from treasuries into high yield bonds, you could have actually, on a life of like basis, you could have actually increased your yield by up to eight times over the course of the past decade. So it's all relative when thinking about the income that you can achieve from different sub asset classes within fixed income. And to another point, the average duration for junk bonds has actually slipped from four and a half years at the beginning or at the turn of the millennium to only three years now. So what that means is that high yield is now less sensitive to changes in interest rates, which is the opposite of what we're seeing in the investment grade sector. So just to wrap it up, I believe that junk bonds will be critical to delivering income and helping investors meet their investment objectives in this new market cycle that we inhabit. And I think that portfolios will need to be sh uh, shaped up and to reflect this market reality, which is something that we're, that we're currently working on within our portfolios and uh, communicating this to our clients and investors as well. And with that, I think it's now over to our equity team, if there are no questions, and I'll throw that over to Simon. Perfect. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we've obviously had a few different comments now about uh, potential for rising inflation, very low interest rates, very low available yields, and then Jeff uh, finishing up on uh, how much some of these credit spreads have narrowed in as well. So kind of leaves it, I guess, for some of the equity uh, ideas, suggestions, and thoughts uh, to try and put a little bit of a positive end to uh, the webinar. Uh, we have got a couple of questions which we'll come on to at the end. There's just a couple of couple of different points that I wanted to make, uh, and I'll get um, uh, Max Sass and Michael to, to join. Um, it was only when we were preparing for the webinar that I realized it was almost a year ago uh, to the day. It was back on the the 11th of February 2020 that we were looking internally at the impact of this spreading virus at what at that point was predominantly only in China. Um, obviously, we didn't have any idea that we would be uh, pretty much a year on sitting from home doing uh, doing webinars and uh, working full time remotely. Um, but what we did think at the time was that this was going to have a significant supply chain impact that would spread very quickly across the world. So within February, and as we kind of rolled into March, and at the start of March on the 10th, we launched our concept of uh, our sort of COVID-19 investment strategy. We split initially this into two different boxes. We were looking at, um, first of all, the resilient basket. And the idea with uh, these companies was we were trying to find companies where they have 
business models that even in a full lockdown environment that we kind of went into towards the end of March would continue to generate revenue and would continue to grow and succeed as a as a business. Um, and so just wanted to take a couple of minutes to kind of look back at our resilient and our recovery baskets uh, and then we can kind of take a look at the the route forward from here. Uh, so speaking about our selection and criteria, so let's say start from a resilient basket and uh, we were looking at businesses which can operate uh, successfully through the pandemic and these were primarily companies which uh, were geared towards um, existing uh, structural uh, long-term uh, trends and uh, for instance even uh, before pandemic uh, we introduced uh, two investment themes video games and online life and uh, actually this uh, a resilient basket, uh, we find out a lot of names, uh, they already been uh, in our uh, screens. So, and uh, the situation with virus allowed uh, these companies uh, to, uh, to uh, increase market share and uh, it kind of drive uh, kind of faster adoption of these trends. Uh, let me ask uh, Max, just maybe pick up one uh, stock just to illustrate uh, what kind of features we've been looking at uh, once we uh, created the screen. Uh, sure, so the company I would like to highlight is Greedy.com. Uh, it's a major e-commerce player in China. It's actually the second largest with a 20% market share. And uh, so this company primarily operates in the uh, like consumer electronics, also uh, food industries. And it's actually uh, last year became the largest supermarket in China. And I remember reading um, its results uh, starting with Q1, as China was the first country to go into, lock, uh, into lockdown and as like the overall tone was quite bearish. Uh, whereas when you looked at, uh, when I looked at JD.com, uh, it posted uh, like strong revenue growth, the guidance was upbeat and it just uh, showed you the, the environment the country was in and how the company uh, was key in addressing the needs of uh, average people. And over the last year, I think it's, uh, it's done fantastically and uh, totally justified its uh, place in the resilient basket. Perfect, thanks, Max. And as uh, Mikhail was saying, one of the uh, strong positives from our side was having had these thematic concepts of emerging market consumer combined with online life. We've seen a lot of those names replicated not so much in the recovery basket um, the idea with this one was trying to get companies that we would like to take exposure to uh, where they very definitely had impacted business models uh, in the sort of some of the names you can see on the list um, when we're talking about uh, dealerships that were forced to close shops that were forced to close and a struggle to generate an ongoing uh, revenue model, but at the same time, companies that we liked, that we thought were blue chip companies, where we would have the opportunity over the coming months to try and pick some of them up at uh, much beaten up prices. Um, yeah, so let's just maybe go through uh, our recovery basket. And uh, for recovery basket, uh, uh, we were looking um, at businesses, uh, income statement of which and uh, free cash flow statement uh, of which been impacted by the pandemic. But uh, despite this, they got strong enough balance sheet. Uh, and it's especially important uh, for us because uh, we expected that um, impacted uh, companies uh, will try to raise additional capital. And as an equity holder, I don't want to be diluted. So uh, also we've been looking at margins because of if there is a uh, better margins, there is an opportunity for the company to increase market share after the uh, pandemic after uh, the company uh, go through this and also we've been looking at kind of optionality inside so for instance if a company already invested in online distribution channel and it was um, kind of small number of uh, revenue coming from online uh, but now company have to sell eight percentage uh, through online it obviously will be bottlenecks it will be uh, enormous pressure on cost but at the end, uh, after this situation, the company uh, will get more marginal distribution channel. Uh, 
uh, also uh, it might be uh, some uh, kind of small relatively insignificant revenue line before but uh, pandemic can uh, make something larger and after the pandemic uh, company can uh, reinvent uh, itself so just to illustrate uh, this is uh, in concrete cases let me ask Maxad just to pick one company for this yeah, actually, exactly on the point of reinventing itself, I would like to pick Disney here because I think it's uh, a very interesting case. So it's a uh, hundred or almost a hundred year old company, which uh, totally, uh, <clears throat> you, you could say it's now a, a new company uh, after the 2020 because uh, into the pandemic, it was mostly about uh, parks and traditional media, whereas coming out of it, uh, streaming is obviously a very important part of the business. And uh, so on the parks, um, back in summer, when uh, parks in Asia were reopening, I remember reading that uh, the tickets for uh, Disneyland were sold out in a matter of minutes. So it just shows you uh, the strength of the brand and also the pent up of uh, the pent up demand for for the parks. But then the, the star of 2020 was Disney Plus and uh, the, the streaming business of Disney. Um, the company originally a couple of years ago, I think, when they just launched uh, the service, uh, put out a. Uh, long-term guidance of 60 to 90 million subscribers by 2024. By the end of uh, 2020, they had, I think, 87 million. So it just shows you how, uh, thanks to the strength of its uh, brand portfolio and content, uh, it just uh, like blew up uh, last year. And uh, on the investor day in December, they uh, tripled or even quadrupled their targets uh, for 2024. So that's that. Yeah, that's uh, for me. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thanks, Max. Now um, I'm just going to throw out another poll, and part of the reason behind this, and when I click through, you'll see a, a number of the different stocks that are on our, uh, we'll call them our sort of 2021 shopping list. Um, and I thought rather than giving uh, Max Sat and Michael the opportunity to choose what they want to talk about, I thought we'd throw the question out to all of you and get you to tell us what you want to hear about. So I've put down a selection of about eight different stocks on here. Uh, so you can choose any two that you want uh, and whichever two get the highest uh, votes uh, is are going to be the, the companies that the, the two of them are unfortunately going to be forced to try and give you some top level thoughts on. Um, just in terms of briefly whilst people are completing the poll, um, you can see here and this is kind of reflective of what we're trying to do in the portfolio. These are companies from uh, different sectors focused on very, very different markets uh, and focused on very, very different geographies. So we have a complete mix. And this is one of the uh, most enjoyable things from my side in terms of looking at these different thematic uh, concepts, um, ideas and structures, and then try to find some of the best names that we think are going to be able to fulfill and are at the forefront of those sectors uh, and markets and where we think we're going to be more interesting to try and build exposure. Um, this is obviously separate to uh, some of the comments that James has been making about being a bit more nimble and one of the issues that we have when we're looking at the portfolios is trying to think about how much exposure do we want to risk which is predominantly equities uh, given where returns on the high yield market are currently and then more importantly where do we want risk uh, so I'm just going to end the polling now um, I think there's a couple of people that just managed to snuck in before I hit end polling uh, and I will share the results with everybody uh, it's actually quite close for second place so we come in with a, a cardo as number one and uh, ASML as number two so I will Pass it over to uh, you two lucky guys. Uh, well, I guess I'll address both companies. Um, so let me start with Akada. Uh, uh, Akada is a key player in online groceries market. It's actually a global leader in uh, uh, e-grocery solutions uh, because this company, uh, which by the way is based in the UK, uh, provides fully integrated solutions uh, for online groceries. Uh, to traditional uh, grocery companies. 
the key differentiator is that uh, the company uh, has the technology and the means uh, and the knowledge uh, to build out uh, the uh, warehouses, fully automated ones. And uh, if you've seen uh, videos on the YouTube, uh, it looks very futuristic, where uh, fully autonomous robots uh, in, in the shape of like boxes uh, move quickly around the warehouse and not only horizontally, but also vertically. So it's a very, um, very efficient warehouses and uh, really like cutting edge. But not only uh, does the company provide uh, the traditional grocers with uh, warehouses, it also uh, integrates them fully uh, uh, within uh, the supply chain of those companies and also, also provides uh, software uh, and after sales service. So 2020 was, uh, it just highlighted uh, the importance of online groceries, especially during the lockdowns when people could not uh, uh, go out, but still needed, um, uh, or, um, should I say, go out to like big grocery stores uh, uh, when they could only go to the local ones, but they still needed uh, to shop uh, for food and products. Right, uh, so that's Akada uh, and ASML. Uh, this company operates in the semiconductors industry. Uh, it's uh, based in the Netherlands. And uh, uh, what it does, the main product of this company is it um, produces uh, semiconductor manufacturing equipment. And um, semiconductors is a very competitive and actually a very, um, globally interconnected and important industry. It powers, uh, I mean, uh, so you can find semiconductors uh, in almost every like smart or intelligent device these days. And uh, as the um, pandemic has accelerated shift uh, to digital economy across uh, all sectors practically, and even uh, like our everyday lives, uh, uh, the importance and demand for semiconductors uh, spiked as, uh, as also James alluded to previously. And um, what it does, uh, ASML, uh, it provides uh, equipment which helps uh, semiconductor manufacturers to produce like the cutting edge semiconductors. Uh, and it has practically a monopoly. I think it's almost like 90% market share in, uh, in this technology. And uh, again, um, uh, as, as Misha pointed out earlier, uh, this is an example of a company which addresses the bottleneck in the supply chain. Perfect. Thanks, Max. Um, given that Picardo was number one and to follow with the supermarkets, uh, buy two, get one free. Uh, and given that Delta was so close, I thought we'd get a third one in whilst we're here. Um, so uh, let's let's have some thoughts on Delta, please. Oh, let me pick up on Delta. So um, Delta is a part of our uh, resumption uh, bet. So we expect a recovery uh, in uh, consumption later this year because of uh, um, consumers got uh, um, elevated, elevated amount of savings, uh, which they managed to accumulate during uh, lockdowns, and we expect uh, this pent up demand will be realized in traveling uh, once it is possible and safe to do so. So, but once we screen for uh, airline. Uh, we have uh, been looking at a large number of uh, sales coming from domestic uh, traffic, and that is why we end up uh, uh, on, on, on US names. So because we still expect that even uh, when uh, sufficient number, sufficient percentage of uh, population will get vaccinated, it still will be uh, some bureaucratic restrictions on traveling and uh, anyway, uh, domestic recovery should happen first, should, should happen first. Um, and also we've been looking at uh, strong enough balance sheet just to avoid the cash burn because we're still thinking that for uh, many airlines um, like, the additional capital raise uh, um, on, on, on the table. Uh, while for Delta, we, uh, we after especially after latest report, when a cash burn came at the lower end of the previously guided number, we think that uh, cash uh, uh, capital raise can be avoided. And uh, also, uh, speaking about latest results, uh, so management uh, been quite was quite confident on um, um, on recovery later this year, and they uh, um, re ready to capitalize uh, on this. While we also noticed that um, uh, the company increased 
uh, employer employee count. So this is also an encouraging sign for us. Uh, yep. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Misha. Uh, I, we've got a couple of questions that have been uh, loading up. We'll go through the next couple of slides and then come back to the questions at the end, uh, just so that people who want to uh, drop off when we finished, but some of the questions are quite relevant to what's coming up. So uh, electric vehicles, um, there's a couple of different components here that I just wanted to highlight on. Um, you know, one of the focuses of what we're trying to do is to uh, you know, take a look forward, hence the, the concept behind the 2021 um, shopping list or, or wish list. But one of the interesting things from our perspective as sort of working as a team is when you ask the same uh, question, you can get multiple different responses. So we were looking internally about different ways that we can try to get exposure to the electric vehicle market. Uh, and we ended up coming back with three different answers to the same question ultimately. So I was gonna ask uh, James to jump in given his uh, background in commodities, uh, but talking a little, a little bit about the idea behind, you know, do you do electric vehicles through commodities components or the automakers themselves? But James, over to you for some initial thoughts. So I tend to, I tend to think that you can do anything with commodities. Um, I'm going to be very, very brief. So I think commodities here are a, a very interesting way to play the, uh, the EV theme um, because you're really capitalizing on, on sort of two factors. One is a decade of underinvestment in uh, mining uh, generally. So you've got a really favorable supply demand balance. And in order to get out of that, um, that sort of uh, uh, underinvestment trap, it takes five to 10 years and a lot of investment. The second thing is that the uh, increased demand that you get from the electrification of transportation uh, is really, really substantial. Um, copper has gotten a lot of attention uh, for exactly that reason. Uh, nickel uh, is, um, is, is, uh, is important in the, in the battery space as well. Uh, lithium's a trickier one to play. Cobalt's a trickier one to play because these are, are metals that you can't really touch um, directly. You have to go through the mining companies. Um, platinum is a is another one that I think has has legs here. Uh, it's it's listed here as a as an electric vehicle play, but actually it's a it's a um, it's a hydrogen fuel cell play. Um, and again, there's this backdrop of underinvestment uh, and a and a market which has really struggled and lost. The capital that it needed uh, for a decade or more that gives it a nice setup. I hope that was brief enough, Simon. That was perfect, James. Thank you. Okay, so we've got James for commodities and on the component side. Uh, on component side, let me step in. So for uh, one more way uh, play, playing or uh, getting exposure to electric vehicle theme is just the components. Uh, it might be a bit safer because of uh, you uh, got more diversified uh, demand and more diversified sales because of uh, these components not only used in electric vehicles but rather in other areas. Um, I'm personally fascinated by hydrogen uh, uh, fuel cell uh, producers, uh, although they rally it a lot, uh, but uh, as uh, James already mentioned that uh, platinum might be uh, a safer and cheaper way of uh, getting exposure to hydrogen fuel cells, while um, beca because of uh, um, uh, these uh, companies, such companies like like uh, plug power ballard they rallied it uh, enormously uh, over the previous uh, couple of months uh, but i still was thinking that hydrogen is an important consideration and this is a kind of future uh, of electric vehicles future or the future if you would like uh, yeah and uh, speaking about uh, um, electric vehicle uh, manufacturers let me uh, maybe ask maxat to join um so in terms of automakers, I think uh, when you say electric vehicles, immediately Tesla comes to mind. Uh, but here I would like to distinguish between um, the stock price and the company itself. Uh, I think the company itself is actually great. And uh, I mean, it, it spearheaded the transition uh, and actually like forced the whole industry to accelerate towards electric vehicles. However, if you look at share price, uh, I mean, it's up so much that uh, it makes you wonder if uh, there is any upside left. So uh, when we think about electric vehicles, um, we try to have a, like a broad approach and uh, within the automaker space, uh, Volkswagen is a very interesting one. Uh, like, because you wouldn't, um, like an average person wouldn't think about Volkswagen as a, a 
a very well positioned uh, company uh, with a, a long term strategy towards the electric vehicles. However, uh, it has uh, a lot of brands uh, under its ownership and uh, it's very active in terms of transitioning towards electric vehicles. So, for example, in 2020, uh, the sales, although the overall sales uh, of uh, traditional cars uh, have decreased, or, um, but its electric vehicles have tripled. And actually in Norway, uh, which is, I think the global uh, leader in terms of share of electric vehicles, uh, Volkswagen Group outsold Tesla uh, by uh, three to one. And uh, in terms of uh, it's the brands that it owns, if you look at Porsche, for example, I mean, Taycan is, is a great uh, electric vehicle and uh, the company itself or the brand itself uh, put a target of selling over 50% of its cars being fully electric by 2025. And by the end of the decade, it expects to sell more than 80% of its cars to be fully electric. So we think Volkswagen is a great play, especially considering it's a much more reasonable valuation uh, to get a long-term exposure to the thing. I would, I would also add that on Volkswagen uh, that actually uh, diesel gate uh, for the company happened in 2015 and that might might be kind of uh, turning turning point and that is why it got um, more uh, time just to develop technology uh, compared to other traditional uh, car manufacturers and the, actually this is the event could be advantage now because of the a little bit ahead uh, other uh, traditional uh, car manufacturers. Good point Misha thanks for that. Um, so that's three different ways of getting exposure to electric vehicles or the electric vehicle market, most of those without actually buying any companies that produce electric vehicles for two out of the three. Um, I'm going to slide across one last poll you'll be probably pleased to hear. Um, I think some of you guys can probably slip off so we can get Paul on and give him a little bit of airtime. Um, so this question is in relation to digital assets, just a T Paul up here. Having gone through how can we get exposure to electric vehicles without buying uh, electric vehicle producers? Paul's challenge has been, how do we get exposure to digital assets without buying Bitcoin? And this kind of links into a couple of the other questions that have been peppered at us over the course of the last uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, so uh, Paul, I will hand over to you. Thanks, Simon. Um, right, so um, as we can see, we've got a couple of views here. Uh, Forgive me, this is uh, a slightly subjective analysis, but uh, what we've been looking at is uh, a selection of the stocks that will give you access to digital assets in one way or another. Um, and we've kind of tried to categorize them. So what we found is that um, uh, on, on, our, uh, on one access, we got exposure to the sector. So that means kind of like uh, how exposed are you to the kind of crypto asset, digital asset, et cetera, as a whole. And then on the other side, you got exposed to Bitcoin, where we have, again, focused on Bitcoin rather than all the other digital uh, uh, assets, mostly because uh, most of the known holdings, et cetera, are in Bitcoin. So in, in our top left corner, we have the, the established firms that have either invested in uh, Bitcoin to a small degree. Uh, there's a pretty obvious one there called Tesla. Um, announced yesterday they've got one and a half billion, which is 10% of their 10% of their cash reserves in uh, in in Bitcoin. Um, but you know it's not like all business, right? And they're, they're also looking at taking payments. Again, uh, will it really move the needle for Tesla? You know, maybe maybe not. You've got PayPal, who again, uh, I think I mentioned in the last presentation, are now uh, offering uh, crypto asset services. You can pay in Bitcoin if you're an American user throughout the Bitcoin network. Square uh, are, are more involved. Um, so they actually hold, they hold BTC and it's probably, it's a larger portion of their income. So uh, that's why they're kind of a bit further down. But these are all kind of established firms that give you some exposure, uh, but they're not kind of exclusively tied to Bitcoin. Even with Tesla's, you know, 1.5 billion, when we look at it as a percentage of their market cap, it's not really moving the dial there. Um, so it gives you some exposure, but not complete exposure to, uh, uh, to Bitcoin, the asset, or indeed the sector. Uh, moving to the right, the top right sector, these are kind of um, firms with fairly traditional business models, but they are servicing the crypto asset uh, or the, the digital asset sector. Uh, the top right is Silvergate, they're a bank. Um, they, they pretty much exclusively hold USD. Uh, there's another bank called Signature. Uh, they do a similar thing. Now, these two banks are incredibly popular in the, um, 
in the uh, in in the in the crypto asset world. Why? Because most banks don't really like servicing this this business. So if you're dealing in these if you're dealing in these currencies, then it's really really hard to open a bank account. Silvergate and and Signature, uh, pretty much every digital asset firm will have one or if not both of those accounts. So they're highly exposed to the sector, not overly exposed to the asset price. That's an interesting play. Back to have just listed, uh, they're, they're, a, they're a, a, a futures exchange, a futures and options regulated exchange offering kind of like uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum futures. Um, they actually deliver, unlike the CME, they actually deliver in Bitcoin. So an interesting play there. Again, more exposed to the sector than they are to the asset price, although we're in back's case because they exclusively offer uh, crypto asset, you know, futures, you know, there, there's more exposure on that side. Um, bottom left is a bit of an oddity. So this is MicroStrategy. MicroStrategy are a, a, uh, a, a unrelated firm. So they don't operate in the digital asset space. But what they did do is put a, a hell of a chunk of their money uh, into Bitcoin. So I, I, I checked today and uh, roughly 34% of their market cap is now from their Bitcoin value. Uh, kind of an interesting play. Um, it obviously gives you high exposure to the Bitcoin price. Uh, it's an open question about whether you'd want to go micro strategy versus just having an ETP or a tracker if you're solely interested in the price. You know, with micro strategy, you also get a business that goes with it. Um, so, you know, you, you may want that, you may not. Uh, it, it could also be a way of, I, I suppose, to, for some people who can't access the, the ETPs because of local restrictions, like in the UK, if you're a retail customer, you can't actually get access to most of the ETPs. Um, so again, MicroStrategy might be a play here if you just want pure exposure to the Bitcoin price. And then we have the bottom right corner. And these are, I suppose, crypto asset native firms. Uh, and um, uh, so basically highly exposed to both the sector and uh, in many cases, the uh, asset prices too, either because they rely on them, say, let's say, for example, you know, they're a Bitcoin miner, uh, obviously highly exposed to the price, or if they're more of an, uh, an on-ramp or a trading company like Galaxy Digital there. Um, there's a really big one coming to market soon, which is Coinbase. Um, these are really interesting plays because uh, in many cases, more volatile than the assets themselves, if we look at the performance over the last few months. But, uh, you know, if, if you're kind of from the, blockchain, not Bitcoin school of thought. This is an interesting sector. Look, both the, both the, uh, uh, everything really apart from MicroStrategy really is, is, is an interesting play here because uh, a lot of these firms, so Coinbase, although they haven't listed yet, would be a great example here. They're kind of like an on-ramp for uh, millions of people to convert fiat currency into various digital assets. So um, again, if you think that the sector has legs but you don't really want to pick a winning asset and maybe you think uh, Bitcoin isn't going to be the primary digital asset in the future, something like uh, something from the bottom right section might be interesting to you as well. Paul, cool. thank you. Uh, we've got a couple of questions come in, two of which were in relation to Bitcoin, um, which I'm aware we've kind of gone through without really talking about some of the crazy price movements. One is in relation to Tesla versus Bitcoin and which is the bigger bigger bubble um just in case there are a couple of people that haven't seen the news do you want to just recap very very briefly on what did come out and the reaction and then any thoughts that you have on whether bitcoin's in a bubble yeah sure so tesla tesla's an interesting one so tesla announced yesterday uh, via their filings with the sec that they um they converted 10 percent of their cash reserves into bitcoin which is you know approximately 1.5 billion dollars so a healthy chunk of their cash reserves um and an interesting one, given that Tesla, you know, are known to be quite, uh, uh, you know, are known to burn a lot of cash. So it's interesting they've taken the, the opportunity to do this. Um, but you know, wh when we look at it in the in the scope of their market cap and their overall valuation, I mean, it doesn't really touch the size. What it did do is is uh, give the Bitcoin price a real big boost. So uh, Bitcoin kind of went to uh, all time highs yesterday, and it's come back a bit there. But I think we're about forty six thousand at the moment. So uh, a healthy a healthy Bitcoin price. So I think companies like Tesla and Bitcoin announcing their involvement, uh, sorry, te like companies like Tesla and PayPal announcing their involvement in Bitcoin tend to be tend to drive the Bitcoin price more than more than uh, it will drive the individual stock prices. Um, in terms of which is the bigger bubble, which I think the question is Tesla or Bitcoin. I mean, why choose? You can just buy Bit Tesla stock and, and and now have them both. I think and one of the interesting uh, things here is I mean, Tesla 
is Tesla the uh, electric vehicle producer of choice in the future? Uh, who knows, given you've got Volkswagen and other companies that are looking to ramp this up. And the same for Bitcoin. Is Bitcoin going to be the digital asset of choice in five to 10 years time? Uh, who knows? But I think a lot of what Paul's been talking about here is you can build exposure to the sector, to the infrastructure, to the growing adoption and usage of individuals without having to necessarily try to make that essentially impossible decision as to is Bitcoin in a bubble? Can it go higher from here? Uh, so hopefully that's been a little bit thought provoking and thank you to you, Paul. Um, I will ask James to jump back on just to give a quick couple of comments on your view on the dollar. Thanks, Simon. Um, I will be very quick. Um, <clears throat> the question is whether or not uh, I anticipate the dollar weakening over the next uh, several years. And the short answer is yes. Uh, that is a consensus market view. And uh, it's one of those occasions where I think the market is right. Uh, the main driver here is going to be, I think, the capacity for the Federal Reserve to, uh, to provide for um, a more stimulative monetary policy environment for longer. Uh, the Bank of Japan, the ECB, even the BOE, they just don't have the room. And that will also go hand in hand with the, um, the willingness of the U.S. federal government to increase its, uh, its budget deficit and maintain a higher deficit for longer. So I think structurally the dollar just uh, faces more headwinds than, than other currencies. Thank you very much. I'm going to try and do three questions answered at the same time and we'll see how I get on. So feel free to pick me up if I miss anything. Um, in terms of, so uh, responsible consumption, veganism, uh, millennials, there's been a lot of uh, information about flows into ESG ETFs. Um, you know, we're starting to see changing investor appetites, especially accompanied with the passing of wealth from older generations to younger. It's increasingly going to have an impact. I don't know that I would describe it as inflationary, although it is going to be inflationary in specific areas, even looking at the performance of some of the ESG uh, ETFs, fund securities, if you're buying into an ETF, the ETF has to buy the underlying securities, so you end up getting some asset price inflation. And there has been talk of outperformance, and part of that is driven by that sort of inflow and uh, too much demand, and part of it is going to be on some of the sectors that are being screened out. So I don't know that I would describe that as inflationary, but it's something that we, as uh, Dolphin, are increasingly thinking about and pulling into our conversations when we're looking at uh, ESG investing. Um, in terms of other sectors and stocks, so when we're looking at that shopping list for the 2021 outlook, um, the, the, this concept of working from home, e-commerce, remote working, uh, then we start looking into electric vehicles, but uh, so semiconductors uh, that start going out to cybersecurity. So there's so many different uh, companies that branch off of those uh, central concepts. And then you know the electric vehicle is the perfect example of um, then how that can branch out from there. So we had in our shopping list uh, some mining companies, which is this combination of where where in the value chain do you want to be positioned? And from our perspective, that's about trying to get the right companies at the right price. So uh, stocks, we've kind of shown a lot of the shopping list uh, sectors. I think if I, in fact, I can kind of scroll back to where we are. I mean, if you look at some of the themes that are listed there, which is not the specific sector, but it's very, very broad, um, but quite focused on this idea of emerging market consumers and online life, which I think is going to continue to be um, uh, very key as we go forward. And in response to the final question on buying airlines when they're grounded, uh, all I will say is that we currently own uh, Delta in our portfolios. Uh, and we are um, happy to continue to hold it. So we think that this is a good uh, airline to uh, invest in and continue to own. I think that's probably uh, enough for today. Um, I will uh, you know, send my apologies for overrunning my 15 minutes. Obviously, uh, we've tried to go through quite a few questions at the end there. Uh, if there is more specific information that you're interested in, please reach out to your relationship manager or contacting Dolphin, and we will be happy to provide you uh, with some additional thoughts, information, analysis. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Good night.